by his authority, by his namesake, by his relationship with the Father, by his merit, by the goodness of his finished work, not how well you've worked, what he's done for God, not what you do for God. By that merit, by that authority, by his name, you can approach the Father and speak to God directly because of the work of Jesus Christ. You know, my daughter uh, is grown up and has a job and is living in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And uh, usually, if we're going to chat, I initiate. I'll send her a text, she'll reply, or I'll call her. And uh, uh, if I miss her, she'll uh, call me back. And so, uh, if we chat, uh, the vast majority of the time, uh, because I'm the older uh, probably more desirous, right? Wanting to be the one having the conversation. Uh, I'm usually the one that's initiating. She's busy with her life. She's not thinking about her dear old dad all the time. Uh, but, you know, she's receptive when I reach out to her most of the time. And so uh, it, it's amazing how I can see that parallel with our relationship with God. Recently, someone asked me, uh, you know, who are we supposed to address? When we pray, are we supposed to address God as our Father? Are we supposed to uh, talk directly to Jesus Christ? Should we be talking to the Holy Spirit? Should we not be talking to the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit isn't operating on his own initiative? He's operating from the Father. Should we be talking to Jesus since he's the one interceding for us with the Father? Who do we address? And I think the reality is I don't really care what my daughter calls me so long as she calls me occasionally. And especially uh, so long as she is receptive when I call her. I'm not too concerned with uh, how she addresses me. I'm more concerned that she addresses me, that she responds to me. Now, that's a very human uh, paradigm, a very human uh, situation. Uh, the reality is Jesus spoke to this very issue. Uh, I told the person asking me, it was a question on, on Facebook recently, uh, you know, I told her, look, I, you can talk to the Father. You can talk to Jesus Christ. He hears you. He is God. He is interceding for you with the Father forever. You can talk to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is uh, not a thing. The Holy Spirit is a personality. The Holy Spirit is an entity that we get to address directly. We have the indwelling life of the Spirit who's directing and leading and interceding for God's uh, interaction in us. We have Christ who is interacting with the Father on our behalf, and we have the Father who is our Father and in relationship directly with us. We get to address God as our Father. And so I had a couple of thoughts on this. One, I believe that Jesus Christ came and gave his life to reconcile us to the Father. And there was a lot involved with that. He made us compatible by his sacrificial blood on the cross, made us compatible with his life, and then he took up residence in us through his resurrection and our new birth. So our new creation self is compatible with Christ's life, and then having been indwelt by his spirit, by the very person of Christ, according to scripture, uh, we've been immersed into his life, we've been brought into his life, and he has taken up residence in us then our relationship to God is the same as Christ's. The difference is everything that is true of Christ by merit, right? He's always acted righteously, uh, so he is treated as righteous. He is always uh, in tune with the Father, and so he gets to always experience what the Father has for him. What's true of Jesus by merit is true of us. By grace, we get to enjoy the favor of God that only Jesus Christ could ever merit. And yet their relationship isn't defined by Jesus being a great servant. His relationship with the Father is defined by him being his father's child. And in the same way, you and I are not uh, apart from the Father. We are in perfect fellowship and union and harmony with God because of the indwelling life of Christ. We are his beloved children. So we can address God just as Jesus addresses God throughout scripture. He says, Abba, Father. And then Paul in Romans 8 actually says that we are not given a spirit of fear, 
uh, that we would be under slavery again, but we've been given the spirit of sonship by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. So the role of the spirit is to interact with us as the children of God with God. And the role of Christ's redemptive work uh, largely was to reconcile us to God as our father, just as he's Christ's father. And so we get to address God as our father, just as Jesus addressed God as his father. And we get to uh, interact as Jesus did, because the spirit that we've been given is one of sonship in Christ towards the father. So I love the idea that we've been reconciled by Christ's work into a relationship with God so that we can address God directly. That does not mean we can't speak to Jesus. Jesus is God incarnate. He hears us. He's interceding for us. It doesn't mean that we can't address the Spirit directly who is interceding within us for God. So God intercedes with us, in us, in our circumstances through His Spirit. And uh, the Spirit utters things on our behalf that we don't even know to pray, Romans 8 says. So we're being interceded for by the Spirit. God interceding to us by His Spirit, even when we don't understand what God is up to. And Jesus Christ is now with the Father, according to Hebrews, always interceding, that He always lives, forever lives, is constantly living to intercede for us with the Father. So this is amazing. God is interacting with us by his Spirit in us, and we are interacting with God through Christ's intercession with the Father. But both of those, both the Spirit of God toward us and Jesus Christ for us toward the Father are making possible a communication between us and God as our Father. Jesus himself put it this way in... Uh, uh, this is John 16. Right before he leaves, he's been talking about, I'm going away. You're not going to see me any longer. And, you know, you're going to be in mourning. And the disciples are like, what is he talking about that he's going away? We're not going to see him. Where is he going? Why is he hiding? What's happening? Why can't we go with him? They're thinking very humanly, right? Very fleshly. But he's about to be crucified and resurrected and ascending back uh, into heaven with the Father. And and they're going to go through this season of grieving before he's resurrected and then him not being present once he ascends and he's addressing this issue of his absence soon to come, both because of his crucifixion, but then the joy in his resurrection, but then his absence and his ascension that he's just not going to be there always and he's preparing them for his physical absence. And so he's talking with them and, and says this wonderful thing in uh John chapter 16. In a little while, you'll see me no more. And then after a little while, you'll see me again. He's talking about the crucifixion and the resurrection. Uh, that's in verse 16. And then at verse 17, at this, some of his disciples said to one another, what does he mean by saying in a little while, you'll see me no more. And then after a little while, you will see me again. And then also, because I am going to the Father. So they kept asking, what does he mean by a little while? Is he talking about the resurrection that we all have from the dead? What's, what's that mean? And so uh, skipping ahead a little bit, Jesus knows what they're, uh, what they're talking about. And so he says, very truly, I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. Talking about the crucifixion. You're going to be upset while everybody else is going, yay, we're free of this false prophet, right? They're, they're going to crucify him, and you're going to be sad. But then he says, you will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. Boy, what a promise. Let me just stop right there. Whatever is grieving you and I today, Jesus is not saying it's invalid He's not saying you shouldn't grieve. He's not saying you shouldn't mourn. He's not saying that you don't have a loss. He's not saying that this temporal life doesn't have pain and suffering. He's not saying that God is causing those things, right? It, he is saying that in the temporal, while you'll have suffering, while you'll have grieving, while you'll have mourning, because the eternal supersedes the temporal, your grief, valid as it is in the temporal, not saying you shouldn't ever feel grief, but that your grief will turn to joy. What a beautiful promise, right? He goes on from there. He says, 
a woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. In other words, giving birth is a painful process. That's what we're experiencing in the temporal. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. In other words, her joy for the new life completely eclipses the suffering necessary to bring about that life. What a promise that the suffering we're going through as we put our faith in him during this temporal circumstance, that suffering is going to be completely eclipsed by the joy of the new life that we get to experience out from that suffering. The, the, the spiritual reality of what God brings about is of greater importance to us. He's not validating it. He's not saying that it's good. He's not saying that grief is a, a good thing. He's not saying that what you're suffering is okay. He's not saying that that's completely redeemed so that you're glad that it happened. He's not saying any of that. He's just saying that once once the life of Christ is experienced in that circumstance, once he brings about the spiritual reality of what he's working on in us, that it eclipses the joy of Christ, eclipses the suffering in the temporal. It's better, it's, uh, it's more better than the suffering is bad. <laughs> I know that's horrible English, but the, the difference of the greatness of the glory of God that we get to experience is better than the suffering is bad. He's not saying the suffering isn't bad. He's not invalidating the suffering. He's not telling you not to, uh, he's not invalidating that you're suffering. He's just saying that the, the joy that you will have is greater than the suffering that you must endure in the temporal. That's, that's the cost of the fallen world and sinfulness in the world, not payment of your sin and your circumstances. He's not punishing you for what, uh, the world is bringing about and what our own consequences of sin brings about. He's, it's not God punishing you. His thumb is not on you. He's actually bringing about a new creation birth in us. And as we experience that life for ourselves, the joy eclipses the suffering. So he goes on, he says, per joy that a child is born in the world that overcomes the suffering. It makes her forget the suffering that she went through to bring about that child. So with you, now is the time of grief, but I will see you again and you will rejoice and no one will take away your joy. And so now he's talking about after the resurrection. He's saying, I'm coming back and you're going to have such joy and that joy is going to supersede all of your suffering going forward in the circumstances. So because of a resurrected life that you're going to experience, even though suffering continues, your joy cannot be taken away. The life that we have in Christ comes with the, the fruit of the Spirit that produces joy, and the joy that the Spirit produces is not conditional on your circumstances. No one can take your joy away. No circumstance can take your joy away because your joy is not based on the circumstances. The resurrected life, the indwelling life of Christ, the spiritual fruit of his joy that is produced because of that life, that joy supersedes the circumstances. It transcends the circumstances. He's not going to make your circumstances produce joy. He's going to give you joy despite your circumstances. That's a wonderful promise that your circumstances and other people and even you yourself cannot somehow undercut the joy that the Spirit can produce in your life after his resurrection and ascension. What a beautiful promise. You'll still have suffering, but it won't steal your joy. You'll still have grief, but it won't steal your joy. You still won't always see me in the physical, but the spiritual reality of, of his indwelling life producing that joy in you cannot be taken away. But here he goes on even further. In the context of all of that, he says this, in that day, you will no longer ask me, Jesus says, anything. Very truly, I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask of him in my name. Until now, you've not asked for anything in my name, meaning because I've been with you. I've been with you, so you've not asked him for anything in my name. I've just been with you. You've just gotten what you wanted of me or what I wanted for you. You weren't asking for stuff in my name. I was just with you. But now, 
He says, you've not asked for anything in my name, but you will ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. So he goes on and talks about, I've been speaking figuratively, but a time's coming where it's all going to make sense. It's going to be plain to you. Um, in that day, you will ask in my name, in verse 26, I am not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf. Wow. No, the Father himself loves you. Can you receive that today? God loves you. The God whom you have never seen directly loves you. And he has provided through Christ his divine life and presence within you. He loves you. In that day, you'll no longer ask me anything. Uh, he'll give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you've not asked. Though I've been uh, going on to verse 27, the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I'm leaving the world and going back to the Father. What a wonderful truth. Jesus is not saying that today, you and I, post-resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ, post-salvation for us who receive him, he's not saying that you have to convince Christ to intercede on your behalf, that you have to convince the Holy Spirit to operate somehow on your behalf. He's saying that out of the authority and position and relationship that Jesus Christ has with the Father, you have the right, by grace, given to you by grace, that you have the right to be a child of God. John talks about that in John chapter one. He's saying that you've been given the right, you've been given the credential, and rightly so, because of the finished work of Christ. If you believed upon him, then you have the right to be called the child of God that you are, that's who you really are. So you and I get to actually approach the Father through the authority of Christ who has redeemed us into the family of God by his authority, by his work. It's not that we say, in Jesus' name, all the time. Those aren't magic words. Instead, he's saying the authority of his name is available as our authority. It's not the authority of Mike Daniel. It's not the authority of you. It's not the authority of your parents. It's not the authority of your pastor. It's not the authority of anyone but Jesus Christ. But by his authority, by his namesake, by his relationship with the Father, by his merit, by the goodness of his finished work, not how well you've worked, what he's done for God, not what you do for God. By that merit, by that authority, by his name, you can approach the Father and speak to God directly because of the work of Jesus Christ. I hope that encouraged you today. You can totally, absolutely speak to Jesus Christ. He is God, he hears you, he will uh, operate in your behalf. You can totally interact with the Holy Spirit that is within you, even as the Holy Spirit interacts on God's behalf within you. But listen, you get to address God as your father. He loves you, he wants to hear from you. And like me hearing from Ashley, uh, I don't mind what she calls me, I just want her to call me. In the same way, we get to address God directly. He doesn't uh, uh, want you to just interact one way or another way. There's not a, a formula or a protocol that brings about his favor in your life. Look, Jesus has done what you and I couldn't so that you and I don't have to. Instead, we get to operate with him based on what Christ has already accomplished. We get to address God out of our Christ confidence in his relationship with the Father and his love expressed to us. That confidence brings us all the way into the presence of God and we can address God himself as our Father. For me, I like to talk to him in terms of Abba, Daddy, Abba God, Abba Father, that he is our loving daddy. We get to address him that way. If you want to call him pa or papa or daddy or just father or God, you can, but just know he loves you. He wants to enjoy life with you and he wants you to enjoy life with him, enjoying you. And that's the relationship we get to share with Christ toward God, that we would enter into Christ's relationship with the father. And so we, like Christ, are receiving his love, his direction and provision in our life as good fathers give. And we're responding in love with the Father by receiving his direction, receiving his provision for our life, trusting him, following his lead from the Holy Spirit, 
trusting in his work through the person of Jesus Christ, and willingly addressing God directly as Abba, Father, God, our Daddy. In fact, Jesus says in another passage that we no longer call any human being uh, Dad. Never, we don't call any human our father. Now, I have a biological dad. I love him dearly. He's a good dad. I, he loves me. It's not that we don't recognize our biological dad, but we've been reborn. I'm no longer just in the flesh, right? I'm no longer just of the line of Adam through my biological dad. My real father of my real identity is God himself. And to recognize him as father means I actually call him my father. Be encouraged in that. Walk in the ridiculously graced empowerment of the very name of Jesus Christ towards God as not just his dad that's shared with you, but you've been brought into the family and Christ's father, God, is your Abba father as well. Have an awesome day enjoying God as your dad enjoying you. Thanks.